Hello folks, today I'm going to recap a 35-year-old hard drive from 1985. Now before we jump into the recapping, I should just say a few words. Uh, first of all, some of you may be wondering, who recaps a hard drive? Huh? And the answer is, I do. <laughs> and so should you. If you have a vintage drive that has fluid-filled aluminum electrolytic capacitors on it, like this one does. Uh, folks, I've said this in many other videos before, and I have an excellent video on how to choose replacement capacitors. If you haven't seen it, I'll link it for you in the text description below. But basically, these electrolytic capacitors do not have eternal life. And even if you buy uh, modern day replacements from big brand names like Nichicon or Panasonic, and you get some great specs like 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 hours at 105 degrees Celsius, and then you use the capacitors in a circuit which has an ambient temperature of say only 40 or 45 degrees Celsius. If you do the math, you'll find, oh, theoretically this capacitor should last uh, well over 20 years. But the key word is theoretically. If you look at uh, some of the technical documents put out by any of the major capacitor manufacturers, they all say pretty much the same thing. These manufacturers do not guarantee a service life beyond 15 years. Now that doesn't mean your capacitor is suddenly gonna up and die on its 16th birthday, but what it does say is that beyond 15 years, the manufacturers themselves know that uh, the components, the little parts that make up the capacitor start to degrade to such a level that a, f a red flag should be raised. And you know, these capacitors are just like anything in life, folks, like your clothes, like your shoes, like your house, uh, nothing lasts forever. And the little seals on these capacitors, they'll eventually break down and let the fluid electrolyte to flow out. And even if that electrolyte doesn't flow out and damage your circuit board, which it often does, still, the leaking out of that fluid electrolyte is slowly transforming your capacitor into a resistor. And when that happens, your circuit may have intermittent uh, problems that you cannot explain, or it may not work at all. And sometimes, even if you desolder a capacitor and test it with a good meter, you may get some respectable readings, but yet, your circuit doesn't work right until you swap out all of those electrolytic capacitors. I've had that happen before too. So what it means is that even if you have a keyboard, you could have a mouse, you could have a floppy drive or a hard drive like this one, still, if you have capacitors that are 20, 25, 30 years or more older, you really do need to swap them out to make sure that your device is going to be working smoothly. Now, I fully realize there are naysayers out there who say, hard drives, especially of this old era in the 1980s, they could fail at any time. It's gonna fail, fail, fail. Now, I don't want to you know, pick on you naysayers too much because you're saying those nays uh, based upon your own personal experiences. Many of you have experienced a lot of failed drives through the years, and I can respect that. My own personal experience, well, I've been using computers since the early 1980s, and I haven't had most drives fail. I wouldn't say I've had a lot of drives fail. Maybe a rare few here and there have failed. So, um, you know, that's one reason I'm, I'm interested in uh, keeping this drive going. Uh, but uh, another reason is I've got everything backed up. So even if it does fail, um, nothing that's on the drive, you know, is, is going to be lost forever. And the biggest reason perhaps is that this drive is a, in my personal opinion, an important piece of vintage computing equipment. It still works. It's a 10 megabyte SD-412 drive. I'm not gonna reveal all the secrets about it in this video, I'll do that in a later video, but if you want to give me your opinion on what Macintosh this came from in the 1980s and what kit it originally came with, it's not an Apple drive, by the way, uh, leave me a comment in the comment section below. Uh, but basically, I wanna keep this drive uh, running smoothly. Sure, you could say a motor might fail or it might need some oil or other things, but still, because electrolytic capacitors do fail um, and they get older, I need to swap it out. And that's really why I'm making this video for you today. Uh, yes, you could argue that sometimes there are modern day flash replacement solutions for old drives like this. And by the way, I did find one person who did replace this particular MFM hard drive with a modern solution, and I'll link that for you in the text description below. But still, I like to keep this drive uh, running for as long as it possibly will run. And so that's why I'm going to recap it today. 
Before we can recap this drive, we have to disassemble it. We are not going to take off these screws on the top because that would expose the disc platters to air and dust and debris and basically ruin the drive. You can see from this label on the side, this is model number MM112. And a little stamp on the stepper motor here on the side is showing us the manufacturing date was 1985. I did a little research on this company and found that they are not using rebranded or OEM Rodime or mini scribe drives like some of you may suspect. They were actually incorporated originally in 1982 under the name of uh, Aardvark Discs of all things, but then they refiled to have their name changed in 1983 uh, to the current Microcomputer Memories Incorporated. This company later went on to sell the same drive mechanisms, it would seem, in portable form, even <laughs> including a little carrying case uh, in 1986. And all of their drives are shown in the hard drive Bible uh, under the MMI name. And interestingly, if we look closely at the information given, we can see that the largest hard drive they ever came out with was 20 megabytes. And uh, the company was originally started based on a sales of a three and a half inch drive mechanism. And uh, they went on to sell some half height, five and a quarter inch. And uh, I guess the company folded before uh, they came out with some larger size. But I did see that the Computer History Museum has an interesting document on file. Unfortunately, it's not online but it says that it is definitely from microcomputer memories. It is the manual and specifications of the M112, which is the exact drive that I have. And so I wrote to them about a week ago, but no one ever gave me the courtesy of a reply. Maybe it's because they're under lockdown and shut down, I don't know. But if you work for Computer History Museum or if you have influence on them, uh, I would certainly appreciate it if you could uh, convince them to get this in PDF form online because they have a lot of other documents online. And uh, it would be nice to see what's contained in this. I searched for hours and couldn't find it anywhere else. So uh, this rigid disk drive specification manual um, would maybe shed even more light onto the uh, workings of the drive above and beyond what the Macintosh Bible presented. Now, if you're wondering what this is, this is just stuck on there with two-sided tape, and it's pretty clear what it says here. Um, before, these would have been white. Now, when I acquired this drive back in March of 2007, this was both of these were red. And it may have happened during shipping because it was shipped from the United States to me here in Japan. But uh, the original owner had not opened up his computer to see this, so there's no telling when it actually occurred. But the hard drive does work fine, uh, despite the fact that it had been jostled enough to trigger this uh, warning device. So here's the bottom of the drive. We can see that the controller circuit board is here. Oftentimes on other drives, you'll see components on this side, but this is exclusively the solder side. Uh, these two connectors are indicative of the ST412 interface. And we can see that the Micro Computer Memories Incorporated logo is printed on here. Uh, we also see a variety of revisions. Uh, up here it says revision F, and then down here at the bottom it's stamped with revision K. Uh, it also has a copyright date, which is very difficult to see, but right here it says 1984. So uh, even though this drive would have been manufactured in 85, the circuit board was of course designed prior to that. And we see down here in the bottom left corner, we've got your standard uh, hard drive power connector on the far left, plus five volts, two grounds, and then plus 12 volts. I should mention that I have a green anti-static work area, and this little connector up here is connecting the anti-static mat to earth ground, and this little blue wire is connecting me to earth ground as well, which is very important so that no uh, static electricity will accidentally zap this circuit board as we remove it and recap it. Uh, many of the early electronics in the 80s and 90s, they were, especially the 80s, were extremely sensitive to static electricity. So when you're working on something like this, be sure to ground your surface area uh, and yourself. There are three th screws that I'm going to remove. You can see there's a little bit of residual orange paint that was here. I've actually removed this before, and that's why the paint is cracked, and they put the paint there too. Uh, see if the warranty 
uh, was broken. Going to remove this connector. There's another connector here that needs to be removed. Actually two. And then as we lift up the circuit board, we can see that there is one last connector rather precariously placed at the far back over here by my thumb, which is a ribbon cable that's very delicate and we don't want to break that. And by means of a little prying tool, I was able to pull off that ribbon connector. And last but not least, we have the LED. Uh, and I just need to remember that this red wire goes towards the crystal here. Okay, here's the circuit board. We can see some interesting things here. Um, this Zilog chip is actually a microcontroller, an 8-bit microcontroller, part number Z8681PS. It says it does not have a ROM on the inside. And then we have a labeled chip here, MMI labeled, so some kind of programmable uh, ROM that they wrote. And it was written in pen here by hand, revision J, and it's dated 1984. We have one, two, three, four, five electrolytic capacitors that are 47 microfarad, 16 volt. And then we have one over here that's 100 microfarad, 10 volt. So I'm going to replace these six capacitors today. And that is the entire purpose of this video is showing how to recap this. And the only other thing I can point out is over here, we've got some jumpers but um, you know the disk works fine so I'm not even I've never tried to touch them unfortunately I don't have any documentation for this MM112 drive so if any of you can dig up documentation about the jumper settings for this particular drive then uh, I'd appreciate hearing from you in the comments by the way this circular pad comes in contact with what looks to be a ball bearing on the main motor spindle which of course spins around like this. If any of you know what this little blue piece of uh, plastic is here for, I'd love to hear from you in the comments because it looks like it was broken or even maybe sliced here. I don't know if that was the way, I doubt it was this way at the time of manufacture, but I don't know. It's always been like this as long as I've had it. So please let me know your thoughts about it. And here are my replacement capacitors from Mauser. I will put a link in the text description below for those of you who may actually have this same MM112 hard drive. My soldering setup is a Hakko 937. Uh, they don't make this particular model anymore. And uh, I also have a wet sponge you can see here near my soldering iron. And then I have a Hakko 599B to also further clean off that soldering iron tip. I use only leaded solder. I don't use the lead-free stuff because the leaded stuff is better. And I may or may not use a little bit of flux today. Note that the soldering station is set to 350 degrees Celsius. I'm going to start by removing the 10 volt 100 microfarad capacitor. That capacitor is marked C3 here. And we also see it has a plus on this pin, which means that this one is minus. So what I'm going to do is see if I can desolder him very easily just by putting a clump of solder across both of the pads. And 
kind of worked. And now I got to clean off the holes. Now clean off this area with alcohol, which is important. You don't want to have any gunk on your pins over here. And to clean off the top here, especially if they're might have been some leaked fluid. You want to have it all cleaned up before you put in the new capacitor. And we'll put the new capacitor in, 100 microfarad, 10 volts. Make sure our minus side is on this side, just like the other guy was. So while I press up on him, we'll tack down one side. And here's the replacement. Now if I show the stock capacitor, we can see that the replacement is ever so slightly taller, just barely taller. But for this location, uh, that minute difference is not going to matter. This capacitor is not going to hit anything, so it's perfectly fine. Next I will do C5 here, and I will do it just like the other one. Except I'll put my little needle nose pliers around the capacitor so I can pull down on him as I put a clump of solder across these two points here. And that was pretty easy. I'll put just a very tiny amount of flux on here so as to make my soldering braid work a little bit better. So here's the flip side of the board with C5 and you can see that there's still a little bit of solder in one of the holes here so I'll just try to put a little bit more flex on him and see if I can get him out with my desoldering wick. Yeah, it's still in there. Sometimes you can put more solder on it and suck him out unless it's a ground plane and then it's a little bit more difficult but we will try this technique well he's stuck in there so we'll just try a little bit more flux and our soldering wick again He's stuck in there. You can see him. There's a little bit of flux in there. That's why it's kind of a golden color, but still there's some solder in there. So what I do sometimes in these cases when the solder is misbehaving, I'll use my little needle spiky tool here. This actually is thicker than a needle, but at the very tip it's uh, very narrow and I can easily fit it in a standard hole. And I don't want to, you know, if you do something like this, you don't want to jam it in there and, and potentially jam, uh, damage the trace, but you're just very slightly making the hole wider. 
and you need to do that on top and bottom. And you can poke a little hole through that's usually large enough to get the thin leg of the component through there. And we can see the hole on the left is the one I poked through. It's a little bit more narrow than the one on the right, but it still gives uh, plenty of clearance for the leg of the capacitor to fit through. And our capacitor slides right in. Okay, you have the legs bent to hold him in there, but I'm going to push up on him and then apply my solder. And here's our capacitor with its base sitting flush with the circuit board, exactly as we want with no gaps. And just to satisfy my curiosity, I'm testing the stock 47 microfarad capacitor. And we can see here it's a 2.9 ohm ESR and uh, nominally 47, but it's measuring 43. And I'm measuring it at 120 hertz. If I look at the uh, push the button here, get some the angle. Here's uh, dissipation factor, and here's the uh, quality factor. It's a 10.26, and here is the replacement capacitor. It's uh, spot on 47, a little bit above actually, and the quality is just a tad higher at 11.71. If we switch to ESR, see it's uh, 2.3. So um, even though this capacitor is measuring roughly the same as the stock capacitor, that doesn't eliminate the need to replace capacitors that are 35 years old. So just keep that in mind when you're measuring. You may think you're measuring a capacitor that's by and large okay, but that's not always the case. And again, the manufacturers do not guarantee a service life beyond 15 years. And here is the fully recapped board. I must say this is one of the more difficult boards that I've done, uh, especially in this area of C23 and C25. That's due to the very thick ground planes in this board that act like a heat sink. And even though I tried a 450 watt soldering iron in degrees Celsius, it still wasn't enough to remove the ground side. And uh, so what I had to do is use a heat gun on this area. That's why the silk screen turned very, very slightly yellow in order to heat up this whole general area, in order for my soldering iron to heat up the area and get most of the solder out of the ground foot of the capacitor holes. But even then I still had to use my little poker to poke a hole through. But finally I prevailed and uh, the board is completed as you can see here. And before I put the circuit board back on the drive, I should mention another potential source of failure. If you have a drive like this and it's not spinning up, you might want to check this. This is a mechanical relay. And uh, because of that mechanical nature, it has a higher failure rate than some other components. So you might want to check this if your drive isn't spinning. If the relay is fine, then maybe it's a burned resistor or perhaps one of the motors needs a little bit of oil. And this is the motor, by the way, which may or may not need oil. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is reconnect the LED here. And again, you'll note the strap on me. I'm grounded in this green little sheet mat down here. He's also grounded, which is very important. And the red wire is going to go nearest to the crystal. And then we have to connect this black connector to this little fiddly ribbon cable here. We have to be careful with it uh, because we don't want to break it. And if I zoom in here, you can see I've got the pins in the top and the bottom rows and all the way to the right, uh, just perfect. So now I can push it in. And I now have two separate connectors and two sets of two rows of pins here I need to connect. And then we have our final connector here with the pink and brown wires that go on the outside. You can see the red wire that goes on the inside. We want to make sure this is not a keyed connector so I want to make sure absolutely that this is going to go in the correct orientation otherwise something might be fried. I want to make sure the circuit board is all the way pushed down. That there's nothing really pushing up on it from underneath. And then we can screw in our screws. I'm not tightening it with all my might, just tightening it so that it's not going to come undone. So it's not going to unscrew by itself over time. Well, here is the moment of truth, the smoke test. I haven't powered it on yet. I have a power supply attached to the main power connector. Of course, the data cables are removed. This is just a spin-up test. I have my fluke meter probing ground and the 12 volt line. And of course, because power's off, it's showing zero right now. So let's uh, switch on the power and see what happens. Well, no smoke coming out, and that's the proper sound, so uh, we can't do anything additional until we actually connect the data cables, but I think this test is good enough to show that our recapping job worked. And there you have it. There's much more I could say about this particular hard drive, and that's why this video is only part one in a three-part series. In the next part two video, I'm going to recap this power supply, which of course powers the hard drive. And then in the third installment, I'm going to show you how I'm going to reinstall both of these items back in the original Macintosh from which they came. And then of course show you the boot up sequence, how the software works, and then give you a little history on what this kit is all about. Eventually, I'll put all three videos in a playlist so that those of you who are finding these videos many months or years down the line will be able to play all three videos back to back sequentially. Before I end, I'd like to say a big shout out of thanks to Steven in San Francisco who made a very generous PayPal contribution to this channel in the month of January 2021, which was um, by far the largest contribution uh, to this channel ever. And as I wrote to you in a private email, Stephen, uh, please be assured that your contribution will go towards making this channel better. Thank you.
And that's not all, folks. Stephen has very kindly made available, uh, you'll find a link in the text description below, uh, a link to his Thingiverse on MakerBot's website. And on that page, you'll find a variety of 3D models that he's put together, which you can print on your own 3D printer. But if you don't have a 3D printer, don't worry, you can actually click the link on there that'll take you to Shapeways, where you can, for a very reasonable price, pay Shapeways to print them for you and mail them off. So thank you, Stephen, for making that available to us. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. And don't forget to click the little bell for notifications on when I release new videos. If you'd like to give me your thoughts on this mystery drive, what it uh, is all about, please leave a comment below. I read and reply to every single comment. If you'd like to join Stephen and support this channel, you'll find a PayPal link in the text description under all of my videos. So keep your eyes peeled for part two in this video installment. Thank you for watching today, folks, and I wish you a wonderful day.